Good evening and welcome to Volcano Scouting's 2020 Virtual Summer Experience Virtual Campfire Program. My name is Quentin Comis. I'm the founder and president of Volcano Scouting and this year's Virtual Summer Experience Lead Educator. Tonight we will look back at Scouting's past at Mount St. Helens and celebrate the future ahead of us. We have several submitted videos from scouts from across the country highlighting their songs, skits, and talents. We also have um, our A Story of Mount St. Helens originally produced and performed live at our 2017 Merit Badge Weekend and some really cool videos produced by the Mount St. Helens Institute. I ask that everyone stay respectful and reflective of the events and people portrayed in this evening's presentation. Our staff have been working really hard on this uh, campfire program and hope that you guys enjoy it. Okay, so my name is Aiden Schneider and I'm going to be doing the Scout Oath, Scout Law, and Outdoor Code. So, as an American, I will do my best to do my duty to God in my country, to obey the Scout Law, to support the people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and mortally strong. The Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thirsty, brave, clean, and perfect. As an American, I will do my best to be considering the outdoors, be careful with fire, and to be conservation minded. The following is the origin story of Mount St. Helens as told by the Puyallup people of Washington. According to the lore of its people, long ago a huge landslide of rocks roared into the Columbia River near Cascade Locks, and eventually formed a natural stone barrier that spanned the river. The bridge came to be called the Bridge of the Gods. In the center of the ark burned the only fire in the world so of course the site was sacred to early ancestors. They came from north, south, west, and east to get embers for their own fires from the sacred fire. A wrinkled old woman, Lady of Fire, lived in the center of the ark, tending the fire. Lewitt, as she was called, was so faithful in her task, and so kind to the ancestors who came for fire, that she was noticed by the great chief, T. Shal. He had a gift he had given to very few others, among them his sons, Klikatat and Waist, and he decided to offer this gift to Lewitt as well. The gift bestowed on Lewitt was eternal life, but Lewitt wept because she did not want to live forever as an old woman. Shahail could not take back the gift but he told Lewitt he could grant her one wish. Her wish to be young and beautiful was granted, and the fame of her wondrous beauty spread far and wide. One day, Waist came from the land of the Multnomahs in the south to see Lewitt. Just as he arrived at the Bridge of the Gods, his brother Klikatat came thundering down from the north. Both brothers fell in love with Lewitt, but she could not choose between them. Klikatat and Waist had a tremendous fight. They burned villages. Whole forests disappeared in flames. Sahail watched all of this fury and became very angry. He frowned. He smote the Bridge of the Gods, and it fell in the river where it still boils in angry protest. He smote the three lovers, too, but even as he punished them, he loved them. So, where each lover fell, 
he raised up a mighty mountain. Because Luwate was beautiful, her mountain, Mount St. Helens, was a symmetrical cone, dazzling white. Wais Mountain, Mount Hood, and Oregon still lifts his head in pride. Clickitat, for all his rough ways, had a tendered heart. As Mount Adams, he bends his head in sorrow, weeping to see the beautiful maiden Lewitt wrapped in snow. The forest was absolutely gorgeous. And of course the lakes were, were beautiful because they were all cold glacier fed. And the lakes and the rivers were just, uh, just pristine. You could go uh, along the Toodle River and where a stream comes into the Toodle, a little creek, and watch the steelhead go up those little creeks. Well, just a beautiful area and, and it's a chance, you know, to, a lot of city kids would come up during the summer and that was their first real experience. I'd been up there once, you know, and, and uh, I'd climbed it in 1978. And so I was sort of had seen the area around the volcano from the summit and, you know, obviously amazing for us. The beautiful grandeur of Mount St. Helens has drawn people for decades. As early as the late 1800s, local residents would come up for a leisurely drive through the massive old growth forests, first by horse, then by automobile. They would horseback ride and camp in the hundreds of square miles of this amazing outdoor wilderness. Eventually, summer cabins, lodges, and youth camps dotted the landscape, drawing visitors on a regular basis. During winter, adventurers would hike the mountain, then ski down its almost perfect slope. The more daring would ice hike, then camp at the top for an amazing view. The diehard started clubs for climbing and skiing, all for the enjoyment of spending time at the mountain. Anglers of all ages took advantage of large trout, and there was no better place to cool off than in the glacier-fed waters of Spirit Lake. It was a recreational wonderland. Over time, the mountain became a popular spot for tourists. Spirit Lake, at the base of the mountain, would soon become home to various youth camps, including the Columbia Pacific Council's Camp Spirit Lake. For years, this small camp would host thousands of scouts from all over the Pacific Northwest. Those who visited the camp often remember how they had to canoe into camp hiked the nearby hills and participated in Order of the Arrow ceremonies. Today, there's not much that remains from the camp. During an airlift before the eruption in 1980, a canoe and totem pole were saved from the camp, now on display at Cascade Pacific Council's Camp Merriweather. But the silence of the volcano would soon end.
USGS geologist David A. Johnston and 56 other men and women lost their lives in the unpredictable eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980. The landscape around the volcano was unrecognizable following the blast. A horrible looking sight. That's the way President Carter described the area around Mount St. Helens today after an hour long helicopter tour of the region. Mr. Carter said the devastation was worse than he expected to see and predicted it will take years to clean up the mess caused by last Sunday's eruption of the volcano. We have a series of reports tonight. First, here is Sam Donaldson. It took a lot of helicopters to move the presidential party today. Five small ones for the president and other VIPs, three large ones for the press and other hangers-on, flying by the scenes of devastation now so familiar to television viewers. The rivers clogged with mud and debris, the mountainside gashed and twisted, still steaming in places like some setting from the twilight of the gods. The timber burned and blown down, and even though low clouds kept the president from actually flying over the crater itself, he found it impressive enough. I've never seen or heard of anything like this before. Somebody said it looked like a moonscape, mm -hmm. but the moon looks like a golf course compared to uh, <laughs> compared to what's up there. I mean, this, it is a horrible looking sight. In the small town of Kelso, Washington, the president visited a Red Cross evacuation center, praising the search party volunteers, saying a few words to people who've lost their homes and promising federal aid to the extent necessary. So awed did Mr. Carter seem by the volcano's damage that back in Portland, Oregon, he predicted it would become a site generations to come would want to see. When safe places are fixed for tourists and others and scientists to come in and observe it, I would say there would be a, a to excuse the expression, a tourist attraction that would, you know, equal the Grand Canyon or something. It's an unbelievable sight. From Portland, the president flew to Spokane, Washington, in search of the heavy volcanic ash fallout that reportedly is threatening crops for hundreds of miles eastward. There was a little dust on the runway. But it turned out that heavy rain had already dissipated much of the ash. So Mr. Carter spent a few minutes at the airport, then took off for home. His aides calling the overall visit an important expression of presidential concern. His critics calling it a political publicity trip. The president himself, perhaps saying it best, he was the first tourist. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, with the Presidential Party. This is Stephen Gere. These are some of the sights President Carter did not get to see this morning because of the cloud cover. In the early morning hours before the President's helicopter went into the area, a small maneuverable ABC News chopper flew under the clouds on the east side of the volcano. And for the first time, we saw fantastic scenes that might have been recorded by a space probe circling another planet. Sunday morning's gigantic explosion produced small fires that are still burning four days later. And we could feel the heat from the ash and watch the steam rising from vents in the desolate terrain. In this moonscape, we saw animal tracks made by elk or deer that had somehow survived the disaster. And astonishingly, one set of human footprints clearly visible in the still warm ash cover. Snow and rain were falling and we saw that water is still draining down the mountainside despite the eruption. This waterfall splashing down through the ashes may not have existed before the explosion. This river flowing from Mount St. Helens is not the Toodle River we have seen so often in the past few days. It's the river called the Muddy. And the evidence is clear that after the eruption, a wall of water more than 20 feet high and 100 yards wide slashed through this riverbed, destroying this concrete bridge and carrying this heavy concrete slab from the bridge a quarter mile downstream. We found footprints in the mud of this riverbank, a man, a woman, and a child evidently hoping to cross the river, but finding it impossible to go through the volcanic mud. Our pilot radioed the Forest Service, and a short time later, these rescue helicopters were taking off to begin searching for those who had made the footprints. For some, no search is needed. Our cameras recorded this tragic sight in the now dry bed of the Upper Toodle River late yesterday. Stephen Gear, ABC News, Portland, Oregon. While rescue workers search for more victims of Mount St. Helens' eruption, the volcano has started to rumble again. This latest activity comes at a time when the Pacific Northwest is still assessing the economic loss of Sunday's eruption. June Massell has been driving through the area. 
Interstate 90 going west out of Spokane, Washington was closed today, as it has been every day since Mount St. Helens erupted. Emergency snow plows cleaned up the volcanic ash, now matted down by this morning's rain showers. Yesterday, before the rains, the ash created billowing clouds of dust, and on I-90, it looked as though a snowstorm had hit. In fact, the swirling dust was so bad that when it settled, the ground resembled the lunar surface. But today, the rain turned that volcanic dust to mud. In Sprague, Washington, a small agricultural community 40 miles west of Spokane, city crews were busy plowing and pushing mud. Residents swept mud off their rooftops, afraid the weight might cause them to cave in. All of this from three inches of volcanic ash that covers everything. It's even penetrated inside homes through windows and doors. There's just no end to it. It comes in daily. You know, I don't know how we'll ever get it all clean. The big worry for Sprague, however, is the water supply running out. We have put the people on rationing. We don't want them using their water any more than absolutely necessary for health reasons until the electricity is back on. Because of a power shortage, crews began working on the deadlines today so that more water could eventually be pumped into the reservoir, now only half full. June Massell, ABC News, Sprague, Washington. On August 27, 1982, United States President Ronald Reagan established the 110,000-acre Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument. This would preserve and protect the volcano's natural features for years to come, reserving the volcano for research, recreation, and natural regrowth. Gathering national attention, Mount St. Helens hosts upwards of 3,000 visitors a year. Today, organizations like the Mount St. Helens Institute, Discover Your Northwest, and Washington Trails Association help the United States Forest Service promote safe recreation, protect the volcano's rich history, and preserve the monument for future generations to come. Volcano Scouting is extremely honored to work with these organizations in an effort to bring scouting back to Mount St. Helens. As we look to the future, we hope to build bigger and stronger partnerships with community organizations and nearby Boy Scout councils to host over 250 scouts each year, putting over 500 hours of environmental service into the monument and inspiring future scientists to dream big. Hi, this is my submission for the 2020 Volcano Scouting Summer Campfire. I am doing this for the Indian Lore Merit Badge, Requirement 5E, which requires that I must tell a Native American story at a scout campfire or gathering. The story that I am going to tell is an Iroquois creation myth. The Iroquois are an Indian tribe that mainly live in the woodlands of North America, and this story is called Wise Owl. There is an old saying, wise as an owl. People are always saying that, but the truth is, owls were not always wise. Once upon a time, a long time ago, the everything maker was very busy, making all the animals and all the plants and all of the rocks and caverns and everything else that covered the earth. Owl had not yet been made. He had been given a voice and two eyes and a head and a body and strong wings. 
Owl was waiting for his turn to be formed. I want a long neck like Swan, Owl told the Everything Maker. I want red feathers like Cardinal and a beak like Hawk. Yes, yes, mumbled the Everything Maker. Whatever you want, but you must wait your turn. The Everything Maker looked sharply at Owl. Your eyes are open again. You know that no one is allowed to watch me work. Turn around and close your eyes. I have no time for you now. I am busy creating Rabbit. The Everything Maker turned his attention back to Rabbit, who was shaking with nervousness. And what do you want, little rabbit? The Everything Maker asked encouragingly. Long legs and ears, the rabbit spoke softly, and fangs. Could I possibly have a fan or two? And claws. I would dearly love to have claws. The Everything Maker smiled. I think we can manage some claws and fangs. He smoothed rabbit's long legs and ears. Silly rabbit owl hooted. Why don't you ask for something useful, like wisdom? This is your last warning, Owl. Wait your turn. Owl turned and glared at the Everything Maker. You have to give us what we ask. I demand wisdom. I warned you, shouted the Everything Maker. He shoved Owl's head down, which made Owl's neck disappear. He shook Owl, which made Owl's eyes widen in fright. He pulled Owl's ears so they stuck out far from his head. The Everything Maker snapped his fingers. I have made your ears big. I have enlarged your eyes. I shortened your neck, the better to hold up your head, so packed with wisdom as you have asked. Now use your wisdom and fly away before you lose what I have given. Owl was no longer a fool. He flew away, pouting and hooting loudly. The everything maker turned back to Rabbit, smiling gently. Claws, he thought. But Rabbit had already hopped away, afraid to stay for his fangs and claws. Since Owl knew if he had angered, if he angered the everything maker again, he would lose all that he had gained. Today, Owl only comes out at night, when the Everything Maker is fast asleep. Softer ice cream is the best. Custard ice cream is the best. Soft serve. Custard. Soft serve. Custard. Sorbet. Mm. I'm Hayden from Troop 333 in the Tuscarora Council um, from Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, and you just got a letter. You just got a letter. You just got a letter. I wonder who it's from. Your mom! Uh, time for some space jokes. How do you get an astronaut baby to sleep? You rock it. What should an astronaut do when it gets sturdy? Take a meteor shower. What did the astronaut get when the rocket fell on his foot? Mistletoe. What did the astronaut think of the restaurant on the moon? He thought the food was fine, but there wasn't much of an atmosphere. What is the astronaut's favorite key on a keyboard? The space bar. Did you hear the joke about the spaceship? No, what about the spaceship? It will go right over your head, you wouldn't understand it. Let me introduce our fabulous guest speaker for today, Alyssa Adams. Alyssa joins us from Castle Rock, Washington, which is near Mount St. Helens, and she's right on an old lake called Silver Lake that was created by a past eruption in Mount St. Helens. Alyssa is an interpretive specialist with the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission. She works at the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center and several other state parks within the Upper Cowlitz Recreation Area in southwestern Washington. Her job includes presenting ranger programs, answering questions, giving trip planning advice, and working alongside other park staff to keep the park clean and cared for. She loves being outdoors and sharing her passion for the natural world with visitors who pass through. I'm proud and excited to have Alyssa on the show today with us. And we're gonna begin with Alyssa um, chatting with us a little bit about her career 
and how she came into this work. So first of all, a big hello and welcome to you, Alyssa. Thanks for joining. Hi there, thank you so much for having me. I have a few questions for you about your career path, if you're okay with answering some questions for us. Of course. The first question is, how did you become interested in pursuing this career? That's a great question, thank you. Um, I'm one of those strange individuals that realize what they want to do at a very young age in life. So when I was five and six years old, I was outside playing in the yard, getting dirty, eating things I probably shouldn't have been eating, and somehow survived all of that, and realized that that passion fueled what I wanted to do with my life someday, and that was to be an outdoor educator. Um, for a while, I took the path of zookeeping. I uh, had a lot of fun teaching folks coming into the zoos, uh, what was so significant about the animals, uh, those ambassadors for their species. And then I realized my, my true love was the connectivity between me and the visitors. So I shifted real quick, uh, began working with Washington State Parks back in 2013 during our centennial, and I've been doing it ever since. So I realized early on um, I loved being outside and I wanted to combine that personal interest with a job, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow, that is so exciting to hear about. Would you recommend, if you were going to speak with someone that wanted to do what you do, what would you recommend to them? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. We get that a lot here actually at the Visitor Center when I represent the agency as a frontline interpreter in uniform, you know, the, the tan and green and the flat hat. We get asked that a lot because it's kind of one of those dream jobs and I feel honored to have one of those. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is volunteering at a very young age. For people that know they love being outside, maybe they enjoy um, talking to visitors or sharing stories, um, the first step is to volunteer and see if it's truly something you're interested in doing. Um, when you realize it is, continue that passion. So uh, volunteering at a young age gets you experience to build your resume, um, gets you involved in some really fun community projects, networks you with organizations that share common interests with you. Um, and once you get your, your foot in the door, uh, careers open up for you. So realizing what you like early on doesn't have to happen for everybody, but when you realize it is something you want to do, get in there, get right in the middle of the action, and there's volunteer projects near and far that are looking for helpers, and you could be one of those. So for folks who want to do what I do, um, when I was about 14 years old, I started volunteering at Northwest Trek Wildlife Park. I was there for six years and I loved it. It's one of the best times of my life. And I wouldn't be where I am today without that part of, uh, of my time. Um, and then beyond volunteering, making sure that maybe you get a chance to job shadow somebody at some point to see if that's truly what you like doing. Visit the parks that you're interested in. Make sure you spend time outside fueling uh, what your love is. Um, and then pretty soon you can connect the pieces. Wow. That is a lot of great advice. Ooh. Uh, can you speak to your favorite thing about your job or a favorite memory that you have from working where you're working presently? Yeah, um, I have a lot of wonderful memories here at Mount St. Helens and they're all driven by the people I get to meet. Uh, every day standing at that front desk, welcoming people into the visitor center, helping them to plan their trips, answering fun questions like what animals they saw that day, or what the name of this plant is. Uh, my visitors make my job really meaningful and fun. Uh, but one day stands out in my mind. Um, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, we had some really severe wildfires, unfortunately, where we lost a lot of forest near the Columbia Gorge area. And I was outside um, on, a, on a very busy weekend with a full audience, 60 or more people in the crowd. And I was giving my 1980 eruption talk, which I give time and time again. And right at the part where I talked about the ash plume rising 15 miles up to the sky, ash started falling down from the sky onto me and all my visitors. And they thought I was a magician. They were like, how are you doing this? And I was like, you know what, let's go inside. Because the reality was, you know, we had a fire going on miles away from us, but it was such a large incident that the ash was traveling just like the 1980 eruption. So I remember that day vividly because Visitors were shocked, like, how would I manage to do that? This is the coolest program they've ever been to. And I was so concerned for visitor safety. I was like, let's get out of here. So, you know, crazy moments like that stick with me. Um, but beyond things like that that are out of my control, um, my best memories are just the abundant, wonderful, creative questions I get from children. 
they are hilarious. Uh, I've been asked if I'm related to Bigfoot. Um, you know, I've been asked, you know, are there unicorns at Mount St. Helens? All these ridiculous questions. So that's always really fun. Wow. I do remember those fires that happened a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. That's pretty incredible. It's nice to experience natural disasters with other people and be able to like reflect on what that means for people together. Wow. Yeah, very much so. We had people in the audience that day who actually witnessed the eruption and remember it. And it was a really special way to bring back those memories. And it was almost like the story circle that began. Wow. Well, I want to just end with a final question asking you about the skills that are important to your job. Like what things are useful to help you do what you do so well? Yeah, um, I would say first and foremost, uh, as an interpreter, every interpreter comes with a different set of skills and every interpreter has different passions and different topics or things that they're really interested in. But, but something we universally share, I probably would say is creativity, um, passion, interest in the subject matter we teach, uh, and interest in connecting with the public, uh, customer service skills, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond answering those questions. It, it reaches a special level of like, want to preserve the great outdoors or the historical site you're teaching about and instill that sense of passion in future generations. So I think connectivity, um, passion, flexibility, and creativity are very important skills to have. Wow. Well, Alyssa, it's such a pleasure to speak with you on Zoom. I just want to thank you again for sharing your office space and giving us a little insight as to what it means to work as you do as an interpreter for Washington State Parks. So thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions about Mount St. Helens or the eruption, remember that you can submit your questions to us on our Volcano Tuesday page, and we can even send them to folks like Alyssa. Hey everybody, Quentin Combs here again. Um, I'm out of my Boy Scout uniform. Um, this is the conclusion of our uh, 2020 virtual summer experience virtual campfire. I just want to extend a huge thank you to all the scouts um, and our partners at the Mount St. Helens Institute uh, for contributing to this evening's program. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I just want to take a moment again to thank everyone um, for their patience, their understanding, their willingness to learn with us this summer. Uh, much like yourselves, our team of volunteer staff, um, Ron Comis, Scoutmaster, and my father, Joel Libby and Alec McLeod, um, Mayor Badge Counselors and five-year veterans of Volcano Scouting. Um, and the rest of our team um, across the Pacific Northwest um, have been really excited to meet everyone, to engage with all of you, um, to teach about Mount St. Helens, our natural resources in our country. Um, as kind of a farewell message before we sing Scout Vespers, um, I just want to remind everyone that we are all in this together. Um, our country is currently plagued with a lot um, of challenging things that we need to address. Um, and while Volcano Scouting, much like our parent organization, uh, the Boy Scouts of America are apolitical, um, this is a moment for us to reflect on our personal lives, um, the lives of those around us. Um, some of us may have been touched by the recent coronavirus global pandemic um, that or the social inequalities that exist in our society. Um, all of us at Volcano Scouting extend our, our greatest wishes um, hope everyone is in good health and good spirits um, and together we can get through this. Um, it's very important that everyone practice physical distancing when they're in groups, wearing their masks and practicing um, good personal hygiene um, so together we can beat out uh, the coronavirus and hopefully return to school and work um, and, and kind of a, a regular daily life as soon as possible. Also, um, Without getting political again, just remember to, to carry yourself um, the highest standard by practicing and living by the Scout Oath Law and Outdoor Code and everything you do. Um, there are always opportunities in our world to do a good turn daily. Um, and as Scouts and as good human beings, just try and remember that as you, as you live your everyday life um, and just look out for acts of, of racism and discrimination and fight against them and, and promote a social atmosphere, a social environment with your friends and family. Um, that encourages inclusion and encourages diversity. Um, and all of us at Volcano Scouting wish you the best and hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.
have I done and have I dared everything to be repaired? Listen, Lord, oh, listen, Lord, as I whisper soft and low, bless my mom and bless my dad, there is something they should know. I have kept my honor bright, the old law has been my guide. Mom and dad, this you should know, deep in my heart I